So uh, my my charge here is to talk today about telecommunications policy in Nebraska, uh, where we're going, how we got here, and, and to understand how we got here, you have to understand the history of telecommunications policy because everything is built on top of uh, what happened before. And this goes, uh, we'll go to the Wayback Machine here for the first part of the talk before we talk about current issues. So we'll go to the, the next slide. They've evolved for more than 100 years, and every policy change uh, was, was based on something before it. And uh, all of them together are what uh, have us where we are today in our public uh, debates. So go ahead, and we'll go to the next, next slide. Originally, it was a laissez-faire. Uh, like a lot of uh, systems are. And everybody just built the telephone system wherever they wanted to. They built it down the fence rails. They built it wherever they wanted to. And multiple businesses in the town would build their own telephone networks to connect to AT&T, which was the only one providing uh, services between the towns. And so Lincoln, for example, had three different telephone companies. And if you were a business in Lincoln, you had to buy service from all three telephone companies if you wanted your customers to be able to call you. Uh, and so that was happening nationwide. And in the smaller towns, a lot of co-ops were developed, a lot of things like that. But a lot of small towns really had trouble getting served because it, there was no uh, economic case uh, to do it. Um, and so there was very little regulation in the early days. It was just built out as they saw fit. Uh, next slide, please. So the Communications Act of 1934 was the first attempt to reel in our industry. And uh, the philosophy, you think about where we were in 1934 as a country. Uh, we're in the middle of the Depression, and so there were all the other government reforms going on. Of course, 1934 is when we got the unicameral legislature in Nebraska as part of that. Uh, and, and so one of the reforms at the federal level was the Communications Act, Federal Communications Act. And what that said was we're going to put the entire country into monopoly areas, and you're going to be guaranteed this monopoly area in agreement to serve everybody in that area. And so to allow for this to work from a financial standpoint, they built three subsidies into uh, the, the uh, rates. And the subsidies were the long distance subsidized local. It was considered a luxury to call long distance. Uh, and it would take up to three minutes to connect a long distance call. And they were very pricey. Uh, and that was built in because they figured if you, know, if, if you had the money to call long distance, then you were going to help pay for the network locally. Second was business subsidized residential. Really doesn't cost anything extra to have uh, a business hooked up, particularly a small business and it does a residence, but the, the business lines were always significantly more and the idea was that, that they uh, uh, were able to use that to generate money themselves. So they subsidized the residential rates because again the policy was keep residential rates as low as possible to keep as many people hooked to the network. Third was urban uh, subsidized rural. You would be in a community, and whether you were a block from the central office or 15 miles from the central office, you generally are going to pay the same, even though the costs were significantly different for that. Okay, next. So in 1985, one dude in D.C. changes everything. Uh, Judge Green decides to break up the bell system and uh, have long distance to be competitive. And it all started, uh, one of the early groups that was behind it was a group from Lincoln, Nebraska, uh, that was at the ground floor of um, um, what turned out to be um, uh, uh, MCI. And they had built a microwave network, and they were going to businesses and saying, we can carry you long distance a lot cheaper over the micro, uh, microwave than you can over uh, the rates. And so AT&T sued them. Ultimately, Judge Green said, nope, you can use the microwave systems. And in fact, you can use other systems that have built. Uh, Williams had built along their uh, pipelines uh, a whole system. And so uh, they opened the long distance, but at that time kept uh, the local market still a monopoly market. And then that's when the baby bells were created, the Northwestern Bell, the Southwestern Bell, to handle the local traffic in those communities. Next. So the next year in Nebraska, we passed LB 836, which was, uh, it, it was one of the first bills uh, that was passed to deal with that. And that did some really important things. It streamlined the rate process, it streamlined the tariff process, it gave quality of service regulation, and it made the Public Service Commission the arbiter in, in certain disputes. Now, why is that important to streamline the tariff process? 
Well, when they wanted to offer caller ID, when U.S. West wanted to offer caller ID in Nebraska, they filed a tariff and 10 days later they offered caller ID. In the state of Arizona, it was a two and a half year proceeding uh, and cost them millions of dollars to offer caller ID in the state of Arizona. And it was that way, it's still that way with tariffs. It, it, the company I work for in Arizona now, if we wanna change a tariff, uh, we have to have a full rate case. It costs us a half million dollars and take two years, and we're a 3,000 line <laughs> telephone company in Arizona. Uh, so what people do is they file a tariff that's about three times the most rate that they ever could imagine ever charging, so they never have to file another tariff. But in Nebraska, you can change your tariff, file it on 10 day notice. Uh, next. So um, the financial implications of opening the system meant that it no longer worked because you used to have one long distance telephone company and, and every year the FCC would tell that company how much they owed every company in the, in the entire, every local telephone company in the entire United States. And it was called the settlement process and they would um, uh, notify you and, and you'd pay and that was AT&T's uh, paying to, because they can't connect a call on the local level without that local network. Well, it doesn't work anymore when you have 400 or 500 telephone companies. I mean, we ended up with 400 long distance companies in the state of Nebraska. There were thousands nationwide. So the FCC no longer could take thousands of long distance companies and then say there's thousands of local companies and tell everybody how much everybody owed every company. It wasn't going to work. So they came up with the access charge uh, scheme. And the access charges were paid to access customers to originate calls and to terminate calls. Um, and the subscriber line charge at that time was, was introduced by the FCC, so you paid at that time $350 a month. Every phone in the United States paid $350 a month. That went to the long distance companies to lower their long distance rates. Uh, and a lot of you old timers here will remember, it used to, if you're calling from Grand Island to Hastings, that call might be 75 cents a minute, whereas if you're calling California, it was only 15 cents a minute. And that was because there was the interstate access, uh, uh, subscriber line charge and not the intrastate uh, subscriber line charge. But the regulators were still uh, struggling with the appropriate cost apportionment with the network and quite frankly, 30 years later, are still struggling with that concept of who should pay how much to use the local network. Okay. So the Telecommunications Act of 1996 comes along and it has what, we've re what I refer to, I don't think anybody else does, but I refer to as schizophrenic policy goals because it wants wide open competition everywhere and it wants affordable universal service everywhere. And those two things in rural areas are not necessarily uh, able to be accomplished at the same time because to have full competition, you have to charge what the cost of the service actually is, but if you want affordable universal service, I mean, the cost of, of serving 20 miles outside of Valentine is probably $150 a month. Well, they, they also put a provision in the act that said wherever you lived in rural areas, that would be comparable rates and comparable services to urban areas. So those two things didn't necessarily both work in rural areas, but it did open the local market for competition. It put in a rural exemption uh, for certain interconnection requirements. You know, I don't know in Nebraska, it was the PSC that was going to interpret that rural exemption. I don't think any, any's ever been done in the state of Nebraska, and I'm not sure of more than a couple that have been done nationwide. So the rural exemption was eye candy for the rural telephone companies, but it was really never used uh, in, in, in any uh, meaningful situation. The big thing it did, it said the implicit subsidies now have to be made explicit. So when I started in the consulting business back in the mid 90s, one of my clients in southwestern Nebraska had a per minute access rate of 25 cents a minute. One of my clients in southeast Nebraska had a per minute access rate of 23 cents a minute. So if you're going to call from Fall City to Bankelman, it was going to be 48 cents a minute before you even added in the AT&T costs in the middle of that for the transport, which was another 10 or 12 cents. So you were looking at 60 cents a minute and they were charging you know, 20, 25 cents a minute for those calls at that point. So, and, and they didn't complain too much about it because the vast majority of their business was done in, in US West and, and at that time Lincoln Telephone areas and the rates were lower there. So they lost money there, but they more than made it up in the other areas. Well, the Federal Act said you can't do that anymore those subsidies have to go away. 
So the Nebraska legislature responded in 1997, passing two major bills. First, opened up the local market in compliance with congressional action, so now you could have local competition in Nebraska. The second bill created the Nebraska Universal Service Fund and gave the PSC the responsibility to implement. That had a five-year sunset because there were urban senators that were not sure that they really wanted that to be the policy of the state of Nebraska. So the Public Service Commission then, by 1999, had done all their statewide hearings and they had set up the fund for the full implementation of the act. 2002, it was renewed by the legislature then. In 2004, they adopted a forward-looking cost model that they changed a little bit in 2006. So it went from being strictly access replacement to now being uh, actually a forward-looking cost model. Can't talk about public policy in Nebraska and telecom without at least touching on the public entry debate because that has been a major debate for the last 20 years. 1996, Nebraska Public Power District builds a network between Wayne State College, Northeast Community College in Norfolk, and South Sioux City, the city of South Sioux City. Um, the Public Service Commission rules that they're providing telecommunication service without uh, authority. Uh, MPBD sues, uh, goes to the Supreme Court, Supremes su uh, support the commission. And so in 1997, there was a major battle uh, on, uh, on public entry. MPBD hired seven lobbyists that year. And of course, the telecom industry, you know, it was the full lobbyist employment act as far as the telecom industry was, uh, was uh, considered. Uh, so nothing happened in 97, but in 2000, they adopted the famous dark fiber compromise where public entities could lease their dark fiber, but only just, uh, just went dark, only to certificated uh, telecommunications providers. Um, and so uh, that was LB 827. Uh, LES ultimately sued on that, went to the Supreme Court, and that legislation was upheld. 2005, it finally peaked with the Nebraska Broadband uh, uh, Task Force that was appointed. 18 members on the Nebraska Broadband Task Force studied it for a year and a half, came back and decided that public entities uh, should not be in the business of competing against private providers. Uh, the issue's coming up again, and we'll talk about that here in, uh, in a few minutes. Um, so what's going to happen next? And we're, we're on the slide now, the 2018 legislative session. You can go to another one, I think. One more slide. There we go. So 2017 was the 20th anniversary of the Universal Service Fund. And when the Universal Service Fund was implemented, the definition for universal service was single party voice grade service. That was the standard that was going to be supported by the Universal Service Fund. 1993, I'm the executive director of the Nebraska Public Service Commission. I signed the order that got rid of the final party lines in the state of Nebraska. We had party lines in Nebraska up till 1993. So 1997, you were only four years removed from having party lines in the state. And so the Universal Service Fund, the definition of universal service, single party voice grade service. Is that the standard now that, that you want to support for telecommunications? It is the current statutory definition. It said that the legislature shall, or I'm sorry, the Public Service Commission shall support single party voice grade service and may support advanced services. So the commission has, uh, has gone on and adopted a number of dockets that have gone into advanced services. They have not left it, but the, the definition still is that they have to support a single party uh, voice grade service. Um, so should the Universal Service Fund support broadband? That's one of the basic questions, and a lot of people just assume yes, but when you think about it, the philosophical decision that has to be reached by the policymakers is, you know, the reason the Communications Act was passed in 1934 was that there were massive areas of this country that could not call the sheriff could not call the hospital, could not call their school, could not call anywhere because, you know, when the Communications Act was passed, only about 20% of the people in the country had telephones. So that's what the whole thing has been built around since 1934 has been the ability to, to use a voice call to call 911 now, but to call medical uh, emergencies, to call uh, police emergencies. Now you're talking about extending it to broadband, whether it's business purposes, downloading the Adam Sandler movie, whatever it happens to be, is that a public policy that the state wants to adopt that that is going to be supported by all rate payers for that? And that is a threshold that has not been crossed yet. 
you know, everybody assumes it's going to be done. That's not the definition that's in law, and that's a definition that has to be adopted. Uh, we talk on there about uh, contribution reform handled in, should be handled in statute. What contribution reform is, when the, when the uh, Universal Service Fund started in 1997, it was about a $75 million fund. Now it's about a $40 million fund. And the reason is, is because it's assessed on intrastate telecommunications. How many people, when's the last time anybody in here made a long distance phone call from your house? Uh, nobody does. They use the free minutes that they, what brilliant marketing, free minutes that they get on their wireless phone. Uh, so really the only in-state long distance calls that are being made are being made by businesses. So the assessment base has gone down tremendously to the point where the Universal Service Fund is now only about a $40 million fund. Uh, and so contributions reform uh, changes the way that the assessment's made. It's made on connections. It's made on different ways uh, to support the network. Next slide, please. Um, so also, will the 2018 legislative session revisit the public entry debate? Uh, how do you get rural broadband? Is it a public-private partnership? Um, there's legislation that's pending on small cell development, uh, deployment. Small cell is a technology that it works in urban areas. It, it pushes out uh, the 5G technology that you're talking about, uh, but it's very intense. You have to have a lot of poles. You have to have a lot of attachments. Uh, and, and so there's legislation to try to make it easier to, to deploy that. Municipalities are opposed to that. The wireless uh, our companies are in favor of it, but it doesn't really work in, in rural areas at this time. Um, the rewrite of the 1997 telecom statutes needs to be done at some point. Are the current rate statutes appropriate? Should quality of service for wireless be regulated? Where do you go if you have a wireless problem and you're in a two-year contract? What do you do there? Uh, quality of service for internet or broadband that has a voice component to it that runs voice over internet protocol. Should that be regulated? Uh, next slide, please. Uh, then you go to, to what's going on at the Public Service Commission. NUS 100 is a docket that uh, we're all heavily involved in. Opened in November 2014, attempting to stabilize the Nebraska Universal Service Fund from, uh, from more contraction. Uh, talked about the collections. PSC has historically been a leader nationally. One of the dirty little secrets about telecom policy in the Midwest is Nebraska actually fully implemented the telecommunications law. Iowa and South Dakota never did. They left access rates higher and continued to fund that network, never to get the implicit subsidies out. I always said that you know, the Nebraska Commission back in 1997, what they did was the wave of the future. They waved and nobody waved back. And so the question is, you know, what should be done about that? Um, the commission doesn't necessarily want to wait you know, for the FCC to act. The FCC has been studying it uh, as well. Um, so the other NUSF issues, uh, I'm going to skip the, the 100 because I don't think anybody necessarily cares about that other than to know they're here. So other NUSF issues, um, there's a lot of unresolved questions out there that the PSC has to deal with. Who should contribute to the network and how? Uh, wireline versus wireless, which should be supported to, how, to what extent by the fund itself? The role of the NUSF in broadband deployment, how much of that should be used uh, to, to uh, deploy broadband. Uh, the appropriate data for policy development, how do you get it? Uh, there are certain internet providers in the state that won't provide their information to the commission regarding how much fiber they have, you know, uh, what speeds they offer because they consider it proprietary. Can the commission make the decisions they need to do if submitting that data is not required? And then the elephant in the room in my industry, there's been two major dockets passed by the FCC last year that will pump an additional $54 million a year into the state for rural broadband deployment. There's the, the Connect America Fund, and then there's the ACAM, which I don't remember what it stands for right now, but there's seven rural companies in Nebraska that will collect $31 million a year for the next 10 years uh, from the ACAM model. Uh, so that's $54 million a year. How should that be treated by the commission? Because the money's going to the same rural census blocks that the commission, a lot of their $40 million is going to. So should that be recognized? And what should the size of the NUSF be? If they do contributions reform, should it be 40 million? Should it be back to the 70 million? Is that a tax increase? You know, all those issues. Um, onto the federal issues slide. Uh, 
I don't know if we'll live long enough to see another bill get through Congress, uh, not only on <laughs> telecommunications, but on anything else either. Uh, so, you know, we don't, I don't spend a lot of time going to the Hill to talk to uh, our congressional representatives. Uh, one, because they don't like me. But two, uh, it's because we really uh, aren't doing much on a federal level at the, all the actions at the FCC. So the FCC is looking at contributions reform, as I mentioned, the CAF, uh, the rural USF methodology changes. There's a call completion. One of the things they've done, people in the industry, uh, the long distance carriers, simply they've gone to uh, the different technologies and they won't complete your calls. They just drop them. And there's massive problems with this in the country with rural calls not being completed now because of the networks that are being used. The definition of broadband keeps evolving uh, at, the F at the FCC. How does the state react to that? And then the whole FCC general philosophy with the change from the Obama administration to the Trump administration, you've already seen net neutrality as an example of where it's going to change. What other philosophies, including rural broadband deployment, are going to change as a result of that change in the FCC? Uh, that is my final slide. That's usually a, anywhere from a four-hour to a two-day seminar or 90 minutes for policymakers because they'll give me a long lunch and that's it.